Uh, I uh, was happy to welcome uh, back our colleagues uh, this uh, week from uh, Thanksgiving uh, and uh, come back to work and uh, a lot of stuff needs to be done and have uh, some fresh energy and maybe some uh, fresh ideas. But uh, I hope uh, my colleagues were able to get home for Thanksgiving and spend time with uh, their families. I like to say the thing I like about the Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday and people say why and I say it has my six favorite F words and say what are those F words family, faith, uh, friends, food, fun, football it's among, uh, among others. It's what's not to like about, uh, about that stuff, especially football that was played in uh, Columbus, Ohio on uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, but I hope uh, all Americans were able to enjoy some combination of those uh, things over the uh, holiday weekend. Well, Mr. President, uh, you may be like me and many others across the country who took you may be like me and many others across the country who took the long uh, weekend to unplug a bit by turning off our phone, maybe turning off cable news too so that we could reconnect with loved ones. But while uh, many Americans were recharging, enjoying a good meal with family and friends, maybe watching a football game or doing some early Christmas shopping. Some major news broke over the weekend. And uh, last Friday, on the day after Thanksgiving, 13 federal agencies released a nearly 1,700-page report highlighting the devastating impacts that climate change will have over the next 80 years if we do not change course now. The report was a dire warning to our nation and to our planet, but one that uh, we uh, might have easily missed uh, while celebrating the holiday with family and friends, and I'm sure a lot of people did miss it. Now, I suspect that the fact that this major report was released on Friday of a holiday weekend was not an accident. After all, the report, which was put together by experts from over a dozen agencies within the Trump administration, spell out the very real and very serious consequences of climate change a global crisis that our president has repeatedly called a hoax. In fact, just yesterday, the president said that he is not among the so-called believers who see climate change as a pressing problem. Well, luckily, we uh, don't have to just blindly believe in climate change. We can look at the facts. And despite the Trump administration's best efforts to bury this report on a Friday afternoon, Friday evening of a holiday weekend, those of us based in reality are going to make sure that the clear facts in it are broadcast far and wide. Now, this particular report took uh, not a year, not two years, but three years to write. It uh, was written by more than 300 federal experts, non-federal non experts as well, who volunteered their time. It was only finalized after an extensive public outreach and interagency review process. This report wasn't thrown together to push any agenda. It's a scientific report, and its conclusions should be important to every person, not just living in my state or you know, the 49 or 50 states, but to everybody who lives on this planet, because it has implications for every single one of us. I'd like to take a few minutes uh, this afternoon to go over some of the highlights of the report, and why don't we just start with uh, extreme weather? According to the uh, people say, what is it? What do you mean by extreme weather? I mean. A measuring rainfall in uh, feet, not by uh, inches. I'm talking about uh, fires uh, in states on the West Coast, especially uh, where the fire, the fires, uh, amount of land being consumed is almost the size of my state of Delaware. I'm talking about the number of 500-year uh, uh, fl floods that are occurring every uh, every other year or every year. I'm talking about the number of uh, Category Five hurricanes that we have now compared to what it was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. According to the latest uh, report, which again was released by the Trump administration, climate change will continue to increase and intensify extreme weather events in the years to come. Over the last three years alone, extreme weather events have cost the United States nearly $400 billion in damages due to storm surges, due to flooding, due to wildfires, due to crop freezes and crop droughts. $400 billion have cost the United States. A lot of that money has cost the uh, U.S. Treasury. And it comes in a time when our budget deficits are going up. Budget deficit was uh, taken, uh, I think, picked up by, from the last administration to this administration, I think the deficit was somewhere maybe $500 billion, huge amount of money. Uh, the uh, last year's uh, deficit under this administration was, uh, as I recall, maybe $750 billion. Uh, and I'm told that the expectation for the budget deficit in this year 
is maybe as much as $950 billion. Billion dollars. It wasn't that long ago that the whole budget for our country was less than that. It was less than that. And uh, why, uh, why is $400 billion in damages from extreme weather important? Well, we don't have the money. We are borrowing this money. And these young uh, pages down here, they and their uh, uh, kids, their uh, children, they'll get to pay for that uh, someday. And uh, that's not fair. More powerful and more frequent extreme weather events will increase that uh, figure exponentially and also have far-reaching impacts on people in every corner of this country and well beyond the borders of our country. Let's say, say we, uh, someone happens to live down in the Southwest. In uh, 2017, Phoenix, Arizona, set a new record of nearly 200 days with temperatures of at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about that. Phoenix, Arizona. 200 days with temperatures of at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit in 2017. In 2090, Phoenix could be dealing with an additional 45 days, another month and a half every year. That would be 245 days, which would be about eight months out of the year, where the temperature in Phoenix was 80 or well above that, well above 90, well above 90. Uh, there's an, uh, that's another uh, six weeks of extreme heat in addition to the city's already record-breaking temperatures. Or um, let's say somebody lives in uh, the southeast, uh, let's take uh, Charleston, South Carolina, for example. Charleston, South Carolina experiences 38 days of tidal flooding every year. 38 days. By 2045, the city could experience 180 days of tidal flooding every year. Nearly five times the flooding that occurs today. Or let's say maybe somebody lives out west. Out west, by 2050, wildfire seasons could burn up to six times more forest area every year. I'll say that again, it's hard to believe. By 2050, wildfire free seasons could burn up to six times more forest every year. We've all seen the historic and horrific devastation the fires in California have caused in just in this year alone, in fact, in the, just, uh, in the last several weeks alone, tragic fires. Now, California's a big state. I used to live there when I was in the Navy. Sometimes it's difficult to put into a context just how big and destructive these wildfires are. But uh, we got a poster here that I want to refer to as a wildfire poster. And uh, this is Washington, D.C. and the, uh, the uh, counties adjacent to Washington, D.C. And this, they give us a little bit of context. Here is the area that the recent campfire in California burned in relation to a city that all of us who serve here pretty familiar with, Washington, D.C. and the, the suburbs to this city. The campfire burned an area over three times greater than Washington, D.C. That's how big it was. That's just one fire in just one state in one year. Imagine what we're going to be facing with up to six times more forest areas burning every single year. Now, if the extreme weather conclusions don't make some of our colleagues jump to action, Maybe the information about the health impacts of climate change will cause them to take some notice. This report makes clear that increases in ozone and particle pollution will result in an additional $26 billion every year in health care costs across the country. $26 billion. And here's a particularly startling statistic. Extreme hot and cold temperature in the 49 U.S. cities are projected to result in more than 9,000 additional premature deaths per year. Per year. That's not in a far off developing nation. It's 9,000 more people dying right here at home in the U.S. of A. But if our colleagues are still not swayed by the serious impacts uh, to American health, maybe they will move to be moved by the impact that climate change will have on our country's already aging infrastructure. And I think this is probably uh, highway transportation infrastructure, if I'm not mistaken. But if we do not act, we can expect up to six, $26 billion, $26 billion in damages to our roadways, our railways every year due to climate change. $26 billion in damages to our roadways, our railways every year due to climate change. I think we have a, a poster here that uh, there's a bridge. Uh, not sure where, but it's uh, one of many bridges. We have thousands of bridges around this, around this uh, nation. But increases in rainfall in uh, inland areas 
not on the coast, but in the middle of our country, the breadbasket, the heartland, will threaten up to 6,000 bridges by the year 2090, 6,000. Here's a statistic that uh, we will not be able to avoid, and uh, it deals with uh, sea level rise. Since 1993, up by three inches. What we're looking at by 2010, according to the folks who've uh, worked uh, for the last three years on this federal report from, I think, 13 federal agencies, could be looking at as much as six feet in sea level rise. If we do nothing by 2010, we could be looking at sea level rise of up to six feet. Those of us who live through Superstorm Sandy saw the absolute destruction. That can be caused by three inches of sea level, three inches of sea level rise then. It's almost unimaginable to think about nearly 70 inches. But maybe that's uh, still not alarming enough to get some people's attention, and perhaps the impacts on our farmers and ranchers might uh, sway uh, my colleagues. So let me mention something in that regard. According to this report, the same federal report, more frequent and intense rains combined with rising temperatures are likely to reduce agricultural production in the Midwest to 1980 levels. I roll back the clock to where we were, levels of production in uh, 1980. In the Midwest, that's where we were. We've got a uh, corn and soybean uh, poster here. And uh, what it tells us is that when it comes to crops that agricultural commodities depend on, like corn and soybeans, which are big in my state, farmers could see reduced yields of up to 25%, up to 25%. But maybe some of our colleagues uh, don't come from states with a large agricultural sector where it's important. Perhaps the economic impact might move them to action. An economic impact, impact might move them to action. Climate change could mean up to $500 billion in economic losses every year by 2090. Let me say that again. Climate change can mean up to $500 billion in economic losses every year by 2090. Additionally, almost 2 billion labor hours are projected to be lost by 2090 due to the impacts of extreme temperatures. That alone would cost an additional $160 billion in lost wages. And here's a, a stark statistic. Climate change could, I think we have it right here. Climate change could slash by up to 10% our gross domestic product by 2100. Up to 10%. Uh, let's put that in a little bit of context. About uh, 10 years ago, when we fell into the Great Recession, worst recession since the Great Depression, we had uh, uh, half, half of the losses in gross domestic product that we're looking at from climate change that goes really unchecked. I was just, the climate change could slash, on the, on, according to this report, uh, up to 10% of our gross domestic product by 2100, and that's more than double the losses of the Great Recession. Many of our colleagues here were here during uh, the Great Recession. We saw what happened in our state. Unemployment, over 10%. Uh, over 10 Banks basically stopped lending. Access to cap capital uh, greatly impeded. Trade slowed down dramatically. It was a miserable time, a miserable time. And we fought very hard to get out of it. We're now in the, I think, the 10th, 9th year of the longest running economic expansion in the history of the country. And uh, stuff like this uh, is not going to help in, uh, extend that uh, recovery. But to refuse to act, I think, would be, willingly, uh, would be to willingly usher an economic calamity twice as painful as the Great Recession. So, Mr. President, uh, the numbers and the facts don't lie. The reality of climate change is scary especially for coastal states like mine, the lowest lying state in our country. Our state is sinking, the oceans around us are rising. But the facts that this report so clearly lays out uh, affect all of us. It doesn't matter if you're from a coastal state like some of us or from a landlocked state like our presiding officer, if you, or if you care about public health or the environment or if you care about our economy or national security. This report says every sector of our economy and every person living in this country will be affected by climate change if we do nothing if we do nothing. So as I see it, we got a couple of options we can take up this fight and get serious about addressing and adapting with climate change or we can stick our head in the sand, as some would do, ignore the facts and do nothing, dooming our children and our grandchildren to live in a world less healthy, less safe, less stable, less vibrant, economically vibrant. I say let's fight. And my hope is our colleagues will join us, not fighting against one another, but fighting against this threat that, uh, that we all face. We get one planet. It's President Macron from France who's down the hall about uh, two years ago and spoke to a joint session of the Congress. He said, there's no planet B. We got the only planet. 
And uh, we need to, it's the one we've been given to take care of by our Heavenly Father, and we need to take that responsibility seriously. All right, that's the bad news. It's a lot of bad news in 10 minutes. Um, before I yield to my friend from, uh, from Florida, I'll say this. There's some good news, too. And the good news is uh, there are ways to address this, uh, this challenge, the economic challenge, the agricultural challenge, the flooding challenges, the temperature challenges. There's a way to do it. And the way, among the ways to do it, the smart ways to do it, is to reduce emission of carbon in this, uh, in this country. And the good news is we can do that by adding and creating jobs. 200 million people went to work in this country today, roughly 200 million. Three million went to work in, uh, in jobs where they're involved in uh, renewable energy, energy conservation, stuff that helps you save our planet and preserve uh, our, the quality of life on, on our planet. And there's a lot more that we can add in jobs in that kind of work including building vehicles that run on batteries. And we're making great progress in areas. Vehicles that run on hydrogen and fuel cells where they're getting uh, uh, the only waste product, uh, the waste product from those vehicles is like water. You can drink it. I mean, there's ways to address all these threats in a way that is uh, economically viable. We don't have to choose between all this doom and gloom and a strong economy. We can have, we can address the doom and gloom and add a lot of jobs. And we ought to do this. It's going to be a win-win. Oh, this is going to be a win-win. We ought to seize the day. Thank, 